Good morning. Uh oh, I got technical difficulties here. Welcome to the 47th David L. Underwood Lecture presentation by Dr. Howard Rosenthal. I'm LaRonda Wilson, and it is my pleasure and honor to greet you on this beautiful day and remarkable occasion. This program is one of Florissant Valley's most honorable events. And we are, we are excited to celebrate the legacy of Dean Underwood, acknowledge our outstanding faculty, and inspire the entire campus and community. I'd like to take a moment first to recognize the Underwood family, those who are here with us and those who are tuning in virtually. We acknowledge them for their steadfast commitment to Florissant Valley, their dedication in attending these events, supporting recipients while preparing for their lectures, offering pictures, stories, love, and those beautiful smiles that both Mrs. Annabelle Underwood and Kathy consistently have on their faces. I understand we even have family tuning in from Florida. We are honored. As I mentioned earlier, this event is meant to inspire and true to form, Past recipients have done just that for 46 years. Please allow us to honor and acknowledge you today. We know that there are several who are watching virtually and some here in the audience. We love and appreciate all of you. Will our past Underwood awardees in the audience please stand and receive this acknowledgement? We would also like to acknowledge our college leadership joining us today. Will you please stand so that we can receive you? And with great admiration, we acknowledge our illustrious Florissant Valley community. Thank you all for tuning in and being present with us today. I would be remiss if I didn't uplift our amazing Underwood committee that includes myself, last year's Underwood recipient, Steve Allen, the 44th Underwood recipient, and Sharon North, the 45th Underwood recipient. We would not have been able to pull off today's events without the talents, supports, and skill sets of Shatana Stewart, our marketing manager here at Florissant Valley. And our outstanding theater, media, and technical gurus, Bryant T. Williamson, Marie McCool, and Aaron Lender. And of course, our campus president, Dr. Elizabeth Perkins, who rolled up her sleeves this summer and willingly did some supportive work without admin support. Our gratitude is endless. We also want to recognize and thank the Human Services Deans, Deborah Harper LeBlanc at Forest Park, and our very own Janice Nesser Chu. <laughs> Howard has said several times, without his colleague and dear friend, Joanne Galanis, that he couldn't have pulled up his presentation today. And if you know Joanne, you absolutely know her talent and institutional knowledge. 
Thank you, Joanne. The Underwood lecturer is selected based off a very high standard that Dean David L. Underwood exhibited. He was known for his love of education. He was deeply concerned with the welfare of students and staff alike. His dedication went beyond office hours, and he tirelessly gave of his time and talents to further the educational mission here at Florissant Valley. Recipients of the Underwood Memorial Lecture Award demonstrate the same dedication and commitment. Chosen by a committee of peers, the recipient exhibits excellence in instruction and a genuine humanistic concern for students, faculty, staff, and all of education. If you've ever had a conversation with any of Howard's students, even those from 20 years or more, you'll hear echoes of Dean Underwood's character. One of the most treasured experiences is revealing to the Underwood recipient that they have been selected as the next awardee. Mother Nature made sure both Howard and I had an unforgettable memory on a very snowy and icy December day. In addition to our somewhat of a COVID and social distancing world, so I had to figure out a way to get to Howard at his home. I sent a distressful message and told him I had to talk to him in person and it had to be that day. Not realizing the difference in weather on my side of town versus his side of town. And to make matters more interesting, Howard has a pretty steep inclined driveway that was icy. To be fair, y'all, he did warn me of that. So I tried to pull into his very steep, icy, inclined driveway and slid down sideways. But oh, I was determined to pull this off. So I found a safe way to park and gently trekked through the foot high snow across his lawn and finally made it to his door. I was on a very important mission. An already super concerned Howard is now frightened that I was distressed by work and now by sliding sideways down his driveway. So he's desperately trying to put me at ease. But because of all of the weather drama, I forgot that I was supposed to be distressed from work. I finally gathered myself and told him that I wanted to thank him for having such wonderful human service students and allowing me to work with them during their practicum and gave him a couple of rolled up t-shirts that included a note informing him that he was the 47th Underwood recipient. Well, the note dropped. I pointed out that something dropped. He told me he'd get it later. I can't make this up. <laughs> His counseling background trained him very well not to look at anything that could possibly be confidential. After about a half hour of trying to get him to pick up the note, <laughs> I'll never forget the gratitude in his face and eyes and him falling limp on his couch with astonishment and pride. That would be the moment that would bind Howard and I together forever. Before we hear from our 47th Underwood recipient, Dr. Howard Rosenthal, our ears and spirit will be graced by the extraordinarily talented Dr. Paul Higdon, professor of music and interim dean of STEMB, performing Raindrop by Frederick Chopin.
Dr. Hickman for that absolutely lovely performance. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharon North, and it is my honor to introduce this year's David L. Underwood Lecture Award recipient, Dr. Howard Rosenthal, professor and lead educator of human services. Dr. Rosenthal attended the college when Dean Underwood was an administrator. He is a proud graduate of Florissant Valley and is a campus Hall of Fame inductee. He is listed in Who's Who in America and has a Wikipedia entry. He is best known for his lively, upbeat, humorous teaching style and his uncanny ability to bond with a wide range of students. Today, he will share some concrete examples of his creative events targeted to get students enthused about human services, including fashion shows, rap contests, and lectures from top experts in the field. These events often pulled in over 300 students, faculty, staff, and yes, even administrators. Rosenthal is the author of over 10 books and audio programs. Counselors nationwide use his signature work, The Encyclopedia of Counseling, with over 2,500 Amazon reviews, and his audio program to become licensed. He also authored the first ever Human Services Dictionary. His academic bestseller, Favorite Counseling and Therapy Techniques, and a sequel, Favorite Counseling and Therapy Homework Assignments, includes entries from the top therapist in the world. Rosenthal is a recipient of distinguished awards, including the Emerson Excellence in Teaching Award, the League of Innovations John and Suzanne Roosh Excellence Award, most nominated professor for the Emerging Scholars Banquet, Florissant Valley's Outstanding New Teacher Award, and Missouri's Wayne B. McClellan Adult Achievement Award. He has won several Teaching Tips of the Year awards. Howard believes that education should be fun. And examples include continuing education courses he taught, 16 surefire ways to publish your nonfiction book, the psychology of writing the perfect eBay ad, and even how to start a successful home mail order business. His straight A's and 30 days presentations are a tradition at our campus. Howard has an Associates of Art degree in liberal arts from Florissant Valley, both a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in counseling from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and a doctorate in counseling from St. Louis University. He has postgraduate training from several prestigious institutions. So some fun facts about Howard include, while in fourth grade, he volunteered to memorize and present Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to the entire school. A woman sitting next to his mother said, that student is going to be a great orator one day. He served a semester as the president of the sixth grade class and president of the sixth grade science club. He performed more pull-ups than anybody in the sixth grade, beating the school record by one pull-up. In high school, he tied for the senior 
who shot the lowest golf score in competition. Howard's mother taught art classes at Florissant Valley, and his older brother attended Flo as well. A drawing of Howard in dark sunglasses was used on a bottle of Fast Eddie's muscle car polish. And Howard's first paid writing job, 10 bucks an article, was for bowling tips in a column in the Mount Olive Herald, Illinois newspaper. Or as Howard will tell you, who says you can't make big money writing? He has written columns for various newspapers, including the First Capital News in St. Charles and the Hampton News in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He penned a column for the largest hair site in the world, hairboutique.com, where his articles appeared next to stories and photos of famous models, celebrities, and movie stars. And in 2003, he was Phi Theta Kappa's most trendy teacher. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Rosenthal. I had the pleasure of studying with somebody who was considered to be one of the top men in psychotherapy in the entire field. And I won't mention his name because of what I'm about to tell you. I went to him at that time and I said, what do you do about suicidal clients? How do you handle them? And he said, well, let me give you an example. He said, the, a few nights ago, a lady called me up on the phone and she told me she was going to commit suicide. And I said, no, you're not. You've got an appointment with me the next day, and I hung up the phone. Now, I've seen this quoted in several textbooks, incidentally, but he was very serious about this. Not long after, I heard that one of his colleagues had a suicidal client and told the suicidal client that the best thing to do was to act out the suicidal behavior because by acting out the behavior, you would no longer have the motivation to carry it out. In the process, this young man drank a can of antifreeze, and he's no longer around to act out the information. So today I'm going to give you some very accurate information. It's all going to be pragmatic stuff. It's all going to be something you can use in your everyday life. Now the first thing that you need to know about suicide, this is probably the best kept secret in the whole human race is that a suicidal teenager does not want to die. But let me tell you why that is so, okay? First of all, the human body uniquely wants to live. If you cut your hand, okay, your hand will start healing real fast. If you're sick, your body will start producing more white blood cells and antibodies to try to cure yourself. What would happen right now, folks, if I would hold my breath and try to kill myself? What would happen? Pass out. Right. You would pass out, and then your body would take care of yourself and start breathing again. You know, I remember when I was in the fifth grade, my teacher handed me an envelope, and she said, this is confidential, Howard, so don't you dare look at it. Well, that was the wrong thing to say to me, folks. And if you grew up in the 50s, what you knew was the word confidential could only mean one thing. It could mean your IQ score, how smart you were. And back then, I had heard this rumor that if you had an IQ score of over 135, you could become a doctor, a lawyer, a human services worker, something like that. You could really make something out of your life. So I can remember it like it was yesterday, folks. I was about halfway down to the office, and I had this envelope in my hand. I was supposed to take it to the principal's office. I looked around to make sure nobody was looking. I unraveled the string. I see a few people in the audience that are uh, mature enough to remember when they had the string on the uh, confidential envelopes. And I pulled it out. And even though there were some scores even more pathetic and more pygmy-sized than my own, I looked down and I saw 
Howard Rosenthal 118, and my heart sunk. I said, oh my God, I'm too stupid to graduate high school. Finally, after I got my uh, fourth college degree, I decided to go back to my teacher and tell her the experience that I, that I did have with this. And so I recounted the story, much as I did today, and she started laughing, and she started laughing harder and harder. Finally, when she fell off her chair, I thought, maybe I better ask her what was so funny. And so I said, how can you laugh? I've been upset about this for 20-plus years. And she said, Howard, you idiot. We never got to see the IQ scores either in those days. And I said, you didn't? What did I look at? And she said, oh, you saw a chart of the class weights. And I said, let me get this straight. You mean I've been depressed because I weighed 118 in the fifth grade? And she said, you got it. And then she said something I'll never forget because it was so true. She said, you know, I really shouldn't laugh because kids are committing suicide for smaller, lesser things than that. Some people want to know, are the statistics accurate? The figures I gave you, the 30,000. Okay, figure for adults, the five or six thousand for teens. The answer is no, they are not accurate by any means. Suicidologists, and yes, there is such a word for those that study the phenomenon, will tell you that the actual number, their best guess, is between, the actual number is two to three times what I wrote on the blackboard. Are you working with the counselors inside the various school systems, or is there any kind of network, or, or are you offering your services to them? We are offering our services to them, and I'm happy to say that many of them have taken us up on it. We have responded to literally hundreds of requests, and uh, you know, it's interesting. We hardly ever do a session with teachers or counselors when somebody doesn't get back to us and say, gee, that helped us circumvent an attempt or save a life. Thank you. Um, by the way, I'm going to give you the first secret in the history of the college, and that is that Don Johnson, who was interviewing me, um, actually went to Flow Valley and graduated, and in 1983, he became one of 41 students who has ever been inducted into the Hall of Fame. So. Um, that's pretty exciting, right? OK, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a trip down memory lane at Flow Valley. I will share what Flow Valley was like for me during the Underwood years. Then I will tell you how I came back as an adjunct, became a full professor, and actually became full-timer, and then became a full professor at Warp Speed, okay? Finally, I'm going to give you five key strategies that you can use in your career to become a better teacher or just improve your career. All right, so let's get this party started. Here is a classic photo of my mom and dad, there it is, before I was born. Although my dad didn't go to college, he was a self-made scholar. I would accompany him to the University City Library once a week, where he would take out books on every subject imaginable. He would often quip, if you can find a library, you can become educated. My dad also had a theory that led me to flow. He did not believe in the magic school. A student could go to a junior college, as Flow Valley was called at the time, and become very educated, or they could go to an expensive Ivy League institution and learn very little. <clears throat> Relying on his knowledge of self-taught chemistry, my dad started a very successful small cosmetics company called SMR Products. Folklore has it, he began formulating his products in a tiny closet. 
He specialized in making shampoos, hair conditioners, and even car polishes. Examples of his ingenuity include the fact that he created the first original rum and egg shampoo and the first organic ginseng shampoo. He was also an outstanding writer and snared first place in a cash prize when Washington University hosted a short story contest. My mother was a stay-at-home mom who loved bowling. One year, she came in second in a city bowling tournament, which was a major accomplishment. Back in the day, St. Louis was the bowling capital of the world, and we were a bowling family. I began bowling at age five and garnered my share of trophies and accolades. As I got older, I would throw some shots and somebody would ask, oh, are you a professional bowler? Now, I was never quite as good as I looked. My first paid writing job, a hefty sum of $10 a column, as Sharon told you, was for writing a bowling tips column in an Illinois newspaper. My self-chosen pen name was Howard Stryker, and I called the column the strike line. Teachers have always had a profound influence on my life. The first was my blow away awesome teacher, Mr. Diamond, in sixth grade at the Pershing Elementary School. This picture appeared in a University City newspaper. That's me on the right, leaning over a desk. I served as the class president and Mr. Diamond was very impressed because I had taught myself how to read schematics, pictorials of electronic circuits. He asked me to be the science club president. My self-esteem wasn't that great back then, and I told him I knew a kid that knew even more about science and radios than I did. But Mr. Diamond said he wanted me. I would hear that again when I attended Florissant Valley. I told Mr. Diamond I would do it. And so he secured $100 from the Ford Foundation to pay for parts and using toilet paper tubes to wind our coils we had each student build their very own crystal radio set from scratch that would play without batteries or house power. Like Dean Underwood, Mr. Diamond hosted an educational show on KETC Channel 9. It was actually called Diamond's Dungeon. Now, I need to introduce you very briefly to a few family members since they enter in to the history of the college. Well, at least my history anyway. This is my older brother, Wayne, who now has 46 years more seniority than anybody in the State Department of Revenue. Wayne attended Flow Valley, liked it, and made a teacher recommendation for me. We'll see how that worked out in a minute. Here is a photo of my wonderful wife of 35 years, Patty, alongside my youngest son, Patrick, incidentally, they are all here today. Patty and I met in 1984 at a client's house 
while making a home visit. We both worked in child welfare agencies for different organizations. Later, a premier divorce counseling agency. Currently, she is an award-winning clinical professor in the UMSL Graduate School of Social Work, where she serves as the Associate Dean and the Director of Field Education. You will quickly see that the apple does not fall far from the tree. My son Patrick is 26 years old and works full-time for Ameren as a business intelligence engineer. On top of having a regular nine to five, he's done a little acting, has developed two mobile applications, including a video game and a very popular dating service app. I will also share how Patrick's argument with his older brother became a learning experience for the top students in the college. By the way, if I gave you a thousand guesses, you could never get guess this one, okay? Here is a snapshot of my 29-year-old son, Paul's wedding. Paul began building computers for me at age nine, and he was selling them on Craigslist at 13. He was one of the youngest persons to acquire top security clearance to work on government web projects. I joke, I had the only 18-year-old who couldn't tell me what he really did for a living. Later, I'm going to share how Paul's love of animals impacted my career. Now, here again, there is no chance you would ever guess this. For me, junior high school and high school were uneventful. I wasn't the worst high school student ever, but I sure as heck wasn't the best. I often question my ability to snare a high school diploma. In the fall of 1970, my game plan was to attend Florissant Valley for six weeks since I reasoned that is how long I would last before I got booted out of the school. My first major challenge came from an English teacher, Mr. Al Schneider, who my brother Wayne insisted I take for comp two. I wrote my major paper on vitamin A because I was interested in alternative health. Strangely, the one scholarly thing I accomplished in high school, which had nothing to do with school, was I wrote Dr. Roger J. Williams, a famous scientist who discovered panathenic acid, also known as vitamin B5, and I asked him some questions. Dr. Williams, whose laboratory ended up discovering more vitamins than any lab in the world, the Clayton Foundation, was very kind and answered me on several occasions. Once I secured my doctorate, I would use this exact same strategy and contact world famous people as contributors for my books on counseling and human services. Anyway, back to flow. <clears throat> At midterm, Mr. Schneider insisted none of us knew how to write a research paper, and we all received a grade of F, okay? Um, I spoke to my brother who surprisingly advised me not to drop out. This was a large class, but by the final session, everybody except four of us had dropped out. 
Surprisingly, Mr. Schneider announced, quote, I can't grade human creativity. Here is a note card. Put the grade you think you deserve on the card. I quietly asked the student next to me what he was going to put. And he said, I'm going to put a B. This guy won't give anybody an A. I felt I deserved an A, put a giant A on the card, and walked off with a grade of A. Keep in mind, I was not the perfect student. Mr. Schneider said to one of my friends, quote, tell Rosenthal his car is a source of noise pollution. Unless he gets a quieter muffler, I will have campus police impound the vehicle. The way it gets worse, what Mr. Schneider didn't know is I couldn't possibly replace my muffler since I had modified my car for more speed and I had removed it. However, after hearing Mr. Schneider's words of warning, I installed an illegal device called a cutout under the dashboard so I could keep it quiet when there were teachers around, but when I wanted to make it loud and powerful, I could pull a lever on the dashboard. A key educational milestone in my career came my way courtesy of a history teacher, Rollin Hahn. I found his presentations fascinating and took several courses with him. I even thought about majoring in history. However, Mr. Hahn was an extremely difficult professor. My friends urged me to take other history professors who were not so difficult. Many times I heard, look, Rosenthal, you're insane to stay in his classes. But one day, I made a life-changing decision. I said to myself, I don't know if it's possible to get an A from this guy, but I am going to give it my best shot. A huge essay exam was coming up after spring break. The weather was awesome, and it almost killed me to stay inside and study during spring break, but I was dead serious about making an A on his exam. We were studying the Great Economic Depression of October 1929. Since this course was before the World Wide Web, I went to the library, took out books on the topic, and purchased several American history study guides. I also read every encyclopedia entry I could get my hands on. I went way beyond just studying the class notes. <clears throat> the day of the big exam, I gave it my all, and Mr. Hahn returned our essays and said, Rosenthal, I gave you an A+. That is only one of two I have ever given in my entire career. My educational self-esteem went through the roof. But here's the punchline, folks. Many years later, after I began teaching at Flow myself, I knew Mr. Hahn's wife, Margie, who was a sociology professor. One day, Mr. Hahn walked in Margie's office while I was talking to her and announced he was retiring. I recounted the story about snaring the second A-plus ever from him. He looked perplexed and said, did I? I don't ever remember giving another student an A-plus. It's possible you got the only one I ever gave. Marger, Margie humorously blurted out, hmm, I never knew you gave anybody an A-plus, Rollin. 
two other amazing professors were Ron Eldringhoff, the second person to ever win the Underwood, who Sharon North talked about in her speech, and Don Tanner. Both guys seem to hold the unwritten patent on making classroom material interesting. Mr. Eldringhoff was a math and a logic teacher who is not like any other teacher. First, he told us to call him by his first name, Ron. Nice. Second, he had a photographic memory and could recall everybody's name and major after taking attendance just one time. Third, he gave fantastic lectures. And fourth, he was cool. I mean, this was not your grandfather's teacher. He looked cool, talked cool, wore cool clothes, and acted, well, for lack of a better word, cool. Take a look at the guy. He looks like he's right off a New York Times billboard. Look at the shades. Look at the sunglasses. Finally, we would have a professor who was our role model. One day, my good friend and classmate Dave said, hey, Howard, this guy Ron is terrific. Why don't you ask him if he wants to hang out with us this weekend? We would have a blast. I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> Me, ask a teacher to go out with us on a Friday or a Saturday night? I'm too scared to even talk in class. You ask him. Well, Dave did ask him, and Ron was professional enough to thank him, but turned him down. But the most influential mentor was my psychology professor, Don Tanner, who became the dean of continuing education. I would count the days, the minutes, and the seconds until Mr. Tanner's next class. He made learning fun. Now, my sister, who didn't even attend Flow Valley, wrote me the other day and said, hey, how for that big speech of yours, that would be this speech, don't forget to make Mr. Tanner the star of the presentation. Mr. Tanner had us keep a journal. In my entries, I mentioned an oral report I presented for my modern aspects of biology class called, Is the Gasoline Engine Dead? At the conclusion of my presentation, my biology teacher, Thomas Tambernino, joked, Howard, you could have just tuned my car and I would have given you an A. After Mr. Tanner read this, he told me he had purchased a car and was not satisfied with the performance. He asked if I could tune his car to make it run better. I told him I was confident I could. That weekend, Mr. Tanner pulled up to my house and drove into my backyard. I had to pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. My favorite teacher coming over to my house? It was a day my family and I would never forget. Mr. Tanner talked to my dad about psychology and his shampoo business, and my dad gave him some products to try. However, <clears throat> he was extremely interested in my mother's hobby, arts and crafts, especially an art farm known as decoupage. She was teaching at some of the art stores. Mr. Tanner hired my mother to teach continuing education art classes at Flow Valley. I never saw her happier. When Mr. Tanner 
learned I had played for the University City golf team and had junior varsity and varsity letters, we set up a time to play together. It was an exciting match. We both played fantastic, and I won by a single stroke. I later learned he was an accomplished athlete who was an amazing high school basketball player and was playing tennis against Hall of Fame athletes. And yes, I checked that uh, st uh, statistic, I guess you'd call it, or whatever, and it was true, okay? He also taught more than psychology. He taught business and even calculus courses. He was the true definition of a Renaissance man, both in and out of the classroom. The final professor who influenced my career was a professor I never had for a course. I didn't even know his name. After finishing all my coursework for my associate's degree, I was leaving the social science building for what I thought was going to be the last time when I heard a lecture that was so informative, so lively, so engaging, I sat in the hall and listened to the entire class. I can still recall the topic, Alfred Binet and the first intelligence test. I said to myself silently, one day I'm going to have a command of the subject like this guy, and I'm coming back to Florissant Valley to give a lecture. The mystery professor turned out to be Dr. Stan Carey, a legendary psychology professor, Underwood winner, and ultimately the college's executive dean. Stan and I would work together, and on one occasion, we even presented together at a national conference. Stan the man is in the house today. Can we all give him a big round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you, Stan. After attending Flow Valley, I went on to snare three more degrees, including a doctorate from St. Louis U. I secured specialized training in biofeedback at the Menninger Clinic then in Topeka, Kansas. Psychotherapy training in New York at the Albert Ellis Institute, hypnosis training with a top SLU professor, and a few psychoanalytic courses from the St. Louis Psychoanalytic Foundation who had teamed up with Washington University Medical School to run courses. For over 10 years, I worked as a Missouri State child abuse treatment worker, a supervisor, and finally, a program director for a large block grant that employed innovative strategies to treat abuse, neglect, and sexual abuse. Now, I don't know if you have ever heard of synchronicity, a concept popularized by the famous Swiss psychiatrist and analyst Carl Gustav Jung. The concept suggests that some things in your life may be meaningful coincidences. For example, when I worked for the state, I met a caseworker named Micheline, since I was supervising her roommate. Well, here we are many, many, many years later, and Micheline Carball and I both teach human services at Flow. Micheline had worked at STLCC in various positions, including the fact she was the assistant to Donna Dare, vice chancellor. But I suggested she would enjoy teaching human services, and I was right. 
After over 10 years at the state, 1974 to 1984, I became the program director of Life Crisis Services Incorporated, also known as the Suicide Prevention Hotline. The position proved to be life-changing. My old friend Synchronicity came into play almost immediately. Our helpline phones were monitored by people who went through an extensive training program. On my first workday, the training topic was abnormal psychology. The woman giving the lecture was named Peggy and her lecture was mesmerizing. I asked what Peggy's job title was, and I was told she was a volunteer working for free. No way. I hired her immediately. That's Peggy with the blonde hair in a photo. <clears throat> I discovered Peg also attended our college district as a student and that we both shared a mutual goal to teach full-time at Flow Valley. Peg was teaching part-time for our district back then. Currently, Dr. Peggy Tyler is a full professor in the psychology department of our division. When it was beneficial, I suggested Peg follow me on several occasions in my career, including the fact that we worked together at the Midwest Plus Stress Center, the Police Academy, and even OptiFast, the program that Oprah lost the most weight on, but I need to clarify that neither Peggy nor myself had Oprah as a client, but I think you would have figured that out. Peggy and other key members of my staff would hold luncheon meetings almost daily to help curb suicide, and I literally made hundreds of key decisions over a chili mac at Steak and Shake. Dr. Williams had told me in high school, chili mac was a good supply of vitamin B. I'm totally making that part up, come on. You didn't buy that, did you? Suicide was all over the news, and I gave suicide prevention lectures and grief sessions from the 79-acre General Motors plant in Wentzville to the Showboat Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. At the end of my three-year stint at Life Crisis, I lectured over 30,000 people. I participated in numerous TV and radio talk shows and helped programs like Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and Good Morning America put broadcasts together. But surprisingly, the one key factor the job accomplished was to reconnect me with Flo. In 1986, I was asked to speak at the Merrimack campus and at Flo Valley. <clears throat> at Flo Valley, I met an angelic woman, and I don't use the word lightly, Later, the 1991 Underwood winner, Jeanette Kimbrough, who headed up the Human Services Program. Human Services is a perfect blend of applied psychology and social work. I also met Jeanette's amazing secretary, Shirley Patterson, a Human Services graduate and the social science secretary. In all the years I worked at Flo, Shirley and I never had a single disagreement. I always viewed her more like an assistant than a secretary. On several occasions, she did so much for the program and my club, my students had certificates and awards made for her. Shirley was here almost 50 years, folks. That's dedication. Another professor, Margie Hahn, 
yep, married to the guy I snared the A-plus from as a student, was also a huge booster of my presentations. I was lecturing so frequently, Ms. Kimbrough asked me to teach part-time. It was a dream come true, except for one small thing. I looked at the syllabus for the course and the textbook, and I told Jeanette I wasn't a fan of either. Jeanette got right up in my face, pointed her finger at me and said, Howard, we don't want the course. We want you. Now, this is the kind of woman she was. It reminded me of Mr. Diamond's comment in sixth grade that he wanted me, rather than another student, to run the science club and help the students build crystal radios. In 1988, I began teaching as an adjunct for the college and won the college's coveted Alumni Hall of Fame Award for my work in social service, mental health, and of course, for this college. Mrs. Kimbrough only got up in my face one other time. I said to her, Jeanette, do you know how wonderful it is to work for you? And she said, Howard, don't you ever say that again. I work for you. Can you imagine having a supervisor like that in your court? It's amazing, folks. Life was beautiful, or so I thought. One Thursday evening in 1993, Jeanette called me. She didn't sound like her bubbly self. I said, Jeanette, are you okay? You don't sound like yourself. Jeanette replied, Howard, these things happen. Just promise me you'll take care of the students. It turned out Jeanette had cancer and had slipped into a coma. The students didn't believe it and thought the faculty was hiding information from them. But Ms. Kimbrough passed away. Students, faculty, and staff were openly grieving and crying in the halls. Emergency provisions were set up and I began teaching over 20 credit hours part-time, all while running two private counseling practices and working as the coordinator of a stress center. One of the things I am most proud of is, except for the day of Jeanette's funeral, I made certain the students never missed a human services class. The position for the Director of Human Services was advertised. The rumor mill in the social sciences was in full force and sources outside the college informed me that an award-winning professor from a top university had applied for the job and I had no chance to get it. On the positive, I was gaining notoriety. A book I wrote, The Encyclopedia of Counseling, was becoming the staple in the field for professionals who needed to pass licensing and certifications. Nevertheless, I still spent day and night preparing my portfolio and myself for the job interview. I took over as a full-time coordinator um, of human program coordinator of human services and addiction studies on August 23rd, 1994. <clears throat> Ironically, my first job was to fire my wife, who Jeanette also hired, uh, because you're not allowed to supervise family members. When I protested that the chancellor's husband was the chair of math, I was told, well, you're not the chancellor. <laughs> and I lived with it, and so did Patty, okay? 
My Flow Valley teaching career got off to more of a buzz than a bang. Prior to one of my first courses as a full-time employee, I saw a student slumped in my chair. This was like the first day of class. I said to Shirley, who's the student in my chair? Shirley said, oh, that's your club president. I'm pretty sure he's drunk or high or both. Shirley's assessment was spot on. Although I would do something different today, I called the student's parents and said, please come over and pick up your son. I think he has that flu that's going around and it's not safe for him to drive home by himself. What flu, they asked. Good question. But that wasn't the end of it. I received terrible reports from other students about problems with this human services club I knew nothing about. The allegations included run-ins with local law enforcement, the highway patrol, drugs, alcohol, and some students nearly being arrested. The students were obviously engaged in unauthorized activities when Jeanette was in the hospital. Before I could even blink, my dean, Alice Warren, called me in. She, too, was getting horrific reports. I told Alice not to worry. I said, it appears most clubs travel. And from what I can see, that's how my club's getting into trouble, and I'm shutting it down. I've got a lot going on in St. Louis. I don't have time to travel. Alice had a slightly different take. Alice said, Howard, look around. There's a lot to be done on this campus. You can run the club, but promise me you will always stay on campus. I don't think Alice knew it, but she changed the whole future of the Human Services Club into an on-campus powerhouse in ways neither of us could have imagined. In the fall, of 1995, I resurrected the club, announced in a new publication I dubbed the Human Services Connection Newsletter. By 1997, I would receive the Thomas J. Choctrick Outstanding Club Advisor Award. The newsletter announced in 1996 that our program would host the National Organization of Human Services Conference for the whole nation, and yes, we did. My newsletter drew praise from an English professor, Emily Liebman, yet another Underwood winner, who asked me to share the idea in a presentation to the English department. A professor at St. Louis University Graduate School saw the newsletter, contacted me, and thought it might be a good idea for their students. In the spring 1997 issue of the Human Services Connection, I announced a new scholarship in Jeanette's name. Put together with a committee with Stan Carey, Shirley Patterson, and Jeanette's family. In the spring, 1998 special students on the move issue. It featured an innovative front page article by yours truly with the captivating title, Long Live the Flow Valley Mystique. The article outlined precisely how the college inspired me as a student. I remember thinking, hmm, if I ever win the Underwood, nah, but I did. After the club reemerged, oh, forgot to say this too. In some newsletters, we were assisted by history professor Brian Garden, who has professional photography skills, and he went to no limit to help us. Once he stood on top of a desk in room 111, to get an aerial view of the students for the newsletter. 
After the club reemerged, it became a superpower, often winning Club of the Year, beating out 50 or more clubs. In one five year period, we took home the gold three times, which Campus Life reported at least at that time was a record. We helped agencies, but generally, we used club funds to help needy students in our own program. Our events helped get students interested in human services as a major. Indeed, we had tiny bake sales, but we also held monster-sized events that packed the entire multi-purpose room, which incidentally was even bigger in those days. Or we would fill the entire third floor of the library. To conduct huge events, you need very high college enrollment, a club president with great leadership skills, the perfect mix of club members, and it helps to team up with other folks like the library, Campus Life, or another club. We won again in 2019, right before COVID struck. Since the pandemic, we have barely had a single student interested in a club. Just too many things going on, and that makes perfect sense to me. Also, if I didn't have a club, I would have the Human Service Program sponsor the event. Now, there are far too many club and program events for me to discuss them all today. But here are a few where we truly hit it out of the park. We ran several fashion shows where any student, faculty, or staff could participate as a model. Now, how do you know when you've reached the pinnacle of success? Prior to one of our shows, I received a joint request from our college president, Dr. Marsha Pfeiffer, and my dean, Nancy Lindsay, asking me to hold the show 15 minutes later than scheduled so they could both attend. And if this isn't the secret history of the college, I don't know what is. Kathy Riley, who worked in the library for years and is multi-talented, often created the brochures for our events. For one of our fashion shows, Kathy sketched a woman in a dress. Our flyers needed to be approved by community relations who felt the drawing was too risque. It's just a drawing, we protested. But Kathy was a good sport and drew the picture again with the dress covering a little more skin in the new version. In November of 2010, the club hosted the first ever Florissant Valley Rap Contest. On that day, Underwood winner Paul Higdon would not be playing his piano because I recruited him as one of three judges. So many people attended that several students came up and asked me if the college was doing enrollment that day. Go figure. We held an extreme makeover contest and even hosted a lecture from one of our textbook authors, um, Marla Bergwager, who actually has written the top uh, social work book in the nation, and uh, we had her give a lecture in the library, and she totally packed it, I would say 350 people. Um, also, Marla co-authored a book with a SLU professor, Julie Berkemeyer, that we use in our seminars called the practic I'm sorry, our seminar and practicum, called the Practicum Companion. We talked both of these authors into coming to our class, okay? I recruited noted psychologist Danny Wedding to come speak on his book, Movies and Mental Illness. 
For those of you who don't know, Danny probably authored the most famous theories book ever published, Current Psychotherapies. So let me make something clear. At the Florissant Valley, we don't really teach human services. We teach human services on steroids. We either get the best, we get the best people. Anything to enthuse the students. I arranged for a therapist who the national news was billing as the real Dr. Phil to present since he created the first dating service based on scientific principles. Some of the events were fun, some academic, most were both. But one event stands out in my mind more than anything else. The club decided to run a workshop to teach students how to wash, wax their car, and clean the interior of their vehicles. A dynamic speaker was recruited who owned a chain of car detailing centers. We even had a hood brought up to the third floor of the library to do an actual demonstration. But the ultimate perk was that I was going to park a special BMW with a price tag of well over $100,000 several feet away from the library door. Therefore, even if somebody hadn't heard about this amazing event, they would see the car and it would bring them in anyway. However, just moments before the event was scheduled to begin, an administrator I barely knew contacted me to say I could not park the BMW in front of the library, stating that the car was too heavy and would do damage to the concrete. What? I protested that the statue, you've all seen it in the quadrangle, has to weigh 500 times more than a BMW. The administrator refused to budge. I had no clue what I was going to do. I began walking toward the library when I spied the chief of police, not exactly sure why. Maybe it was synchronicity, but I began telling the chief about my predicament. What came next was a total surprise. The chief said he was looking forward to the event and he very much wanted to see the car. He explained that in an emergency, and this was an emergency because he wanted to see that car. <laughs> he was able to override an administrator's decision. Now folks, I don't know to this day whether the chief's ruling was valid or not, but he saved the day. We had hundreds of people there. We've invited the community and people loved it. All right. Um, now, the back, we're going to switch gears just a tiny bit here. Oh, oh, by the way, that car event. There was one time I allowed my son Patrick, who I see in the audience, to skip school and come to one of our events. It's pretty darn good, wasn't it, Pat? All right. <laughs> now, we're going to switch gears just a little. The backdrop for the forthcoming historical events I will now discuss includes the fact that Joanne Galanis, my, one of my most amazing friends and colleagues, and I decided to begin our promotion files to become full professors and talk about synchronicity. Joanne and I worked at Flow Valley for years, but we didn't know each other. She ended up meeting me because on weekends, I taught at the MAT program at Webster University, and she took several of my classes, okay? 
1995, just one year after I took over the program, the college secured a new president, Irving Presley McPhail, and everybody had an opinion about him. The rumor was he had a sizable temper, and if he didn't like something, he would let you know. He didn't sugarcoat anything. I had no opinion since I wrongly assumed that as a new employee, I would have nothing to do with somebody that high on the food chain. Boy, was I wrong. Irv was a big bulky guy who stood about six feet five inches tall and had a boomy voice like a subwoofer. He seemed to enjoy throwing around big 25 cent words and discussing educational theory. On October 27, 1995, Dr. Gwen Stevenson, the chancellor, contacted me to say I was chosen for a district-wide task force on general education reform. President McPhail would chair the committee. The committee, scheduled to go on for several years, generally met late in the afternoon and typically went well beyond working hours. <clears throat> Dr. McPhail um, was had a master's degree from Harvard in reading and said he was optimistic we could have a gen ed program on a par with Harvard. Committee meetings were like a class since we were given reading and presentation assignments. I never remember Dr. McPhail giving us a break to stretch our swig a sip of water, which I'm going to do right now. This was all business. At the end of the committee, the chancellor treated us to lunch at what is now the Frontenac Hilton Hotel. Dr. McPhail had a gift for us, a scholarly textbook on undergraduate general education curriculum. However, disappointment set in immediately. The district informed us they were not taking our recommendations and a new committee was formed. Ugh. A few of our ideas were accepted, including a program that my teacher Kathy Petroff and I put together and administered known as service learning. We held a service learning conference and brought in 700 high school students in a single day. That got the administration's attention. Later, service learning was implemented by the talented Underwood winner, LaRonda Wilson, and I just heard from LaRonda yesterday that service learning is no longer around. All I can say is maybe the institution uh, needs to take a few memory pills, okay? But things didn't slow down. Dr. McPhail chose me as the faculty member to work with him on a board of trustees, external scan committee. Never mind that I didn't know what the heck an external scan committee was, okay? I, I just was honored and I thought it would look terrific in my promotion file. The first meeting went flawlessly. <clears throat> My son Paul, who drove up here today from Destin, Florida with his wife, was around two years old at the time, and he loved giraffes. It was a beautiful day, and I decided I was going to be a real dad and take him to the zoo. Yes, even if it meant having to un fold that crazy stroller without my wife's help. 
we were having a great time at the zoo, but I w as I was chomping down on a zoo fari sandwich, I froze. O-M-G. What the hell was I doing at the zoo? I was supposed to be with Dr. McPhail and the Board of Trustees at an external scan committee. How could I have forgotten? All right. I went home and I told Patty what I had done, or more accurately, didn't do. And I was sure that Dr. McPhail would fire me. Patty gave me the lecture. You probably know the one. How could you? We have a two-year-old at home. We just bought this house. You can't afford to lose your job, et cetera, et cetera. After my initial moment of sheer terror, I anticipated what had transpired in the meeting. I stayed up till 1.30 in the morning searching early search engines like Alta Vista and mega search engines like Dogpile for relevant articles that might help the committee. I printed everything out on my prehistoric dot matrix primitive printer that moved at the velocity of a turtle strapped with ankle weights and I placed the articles in a giant envelope. The next day, I went to see Dr. McPhail, who was not in his office. His secretary was there, so I explained the situation to her. Quote, I could lie, tell him I was on a plane, hijacked to another country, but he'd see right through it in a minute. I'm not a good liar, and I know he's gonna fire me, and he probably should, but before he does, give him this giant envelope. I expected a termination letter or email, but one was never forthcoming. I ran into Dr. McPhail a few weeks later and he couldn't have been nicer and gave me a fist bump. I contacted his secretary and I told her I was baffled. She laughed, Howard, I think I have an explanation. The same day I dropped my care package off, somebody from the chancellor's office came to pay Dr. McPhail a visit. All the secretary heard was, look, Irv, I need something in writing on that external scan committee, and I need it now. At first, she said Dr. McPhail looked alarmed, but then he remembered my package and handed it to her. The representative from the chancellor's office glanced in the envelope and said, hmm, this looks good, Irv, really good. Now that's successful crisis intervention. I still had a job at the institution I loved. And despite my trip to the zoo, Dr. McPhail asked me to edit the final report for the Board of Trustees. My next interaction with Dr. McPhail, believe it or not, was the result of my own planning. I was paired with a very popular math teacher and later Underwood winner Teresa Heather to be the MCs for the 1997 Student Government Awards Banquet. I was asked if I could add a little levity to the evening. Add it? Heck, that's my specialty. <clears throat> I told Teresa I believed that Dr. McPhail actually had a good sense of humor and I was going to give him a special gag award in front of an audience anticipated to top 300 people. Teresa's response, Howard, just don't get me fired. Where'd I heard that before? Was Teresa like secretly talking to my wife? Teresa created a ball cap that said Gen Ed 
and presented it to me at the podium for my work on the General Education Task Force. I commented that somebody in the audience deserved it more. I proceeded to walk out and place the cap on Dr. McPhail as the audience cheered me on. I had informed the college photographer, Len Croson, what was coming down so he could snap a picture at the perfect second. Dr. McPhail seemed elated. The iconic snapshot became a page in my promotion file with a caption that read, enthusiasm, creativity, and humor are the quintessential keys to my teaching style. But secretly, even I wondered whether he truly enjoyed it or just didn't want to terminate me in front of 300 people at a hotel. I received an answer when one of our deans visited Dr. McPhail after he left our college, took a job in Nurse State. On his desk was the picture of me putting that hat on him, a picture that probably launched a thousand discussions in the halls of Flow Valley. <clears throat> on the promotion front file, seasoned professors were generous about giving us advice. The most interesting gem these folks shared was that a reference letter from an English professor, Underwood winner, and honors coordinator, Dr. K. Ann Dempsey was worth its weight in gold and could be the most important document in the promotion file. Now, when you consider, folks, that these documents can be like four inches thick, sometimes multi-volume, that's saying a lot. I wondered, was this fact or was it simply an urgent urban legend, okay? Could a professor be so revered, so uh, respected by her colleagues that her letter of recommendation was that powerful? Truthfully, in my case, it was irrelevant because I didn't know her and reasoned our paths would never cross. Days later, I nearly fell off my chair when Dr. Dempsey contacted me to say she heard great things about my teaching and she chose me to run the fall 1997 collegiate honors course on marriage and the family. What an amazing experience. The class was taught in a special room. I had a full-time technology assistant. We were linked to other educational institutions via satellite, and I had a huge budget to pay an endless string of guest speakers, but it's always the little things in life that cause issues. Some honors courses must satisfy disciplines in multiple departments. My course could be taken as human services, sociology, or even humanities. Because of the humanities, I had to teach Shakespeare, and I was told it needed to be quite extensive. It was just too far out of my field, and there was no way I could pull it off. I called Joanne, who had taught humanities, to ask her for advice. She said, Howard, call Dr. Dempsey. She's a Shakespearean scholar, and ask her to teach the entire unit. I sheepishly contacted Dr. Dempsey, who despite the fact that she was retiring, told me she would teach the entire unit on the Shakespearean classic, King Lear. Because she was teaching with me, she could gain more insight into my teaching, perhaps to give me a reference letter. As for me, I had a ringside seat to see her up close and personal in action 
and she was a master at her craft. She lived up to the hype and then some. This course proved to be a world-class educational experience for the lucky 20 students who were permitted to take it. Dr. Dempsey liked my upbeat teaching style and chose me as the keynote speaker for the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society induction ceremony. I was told it was a very serious event. Nevertheless, a little creative humor might perk it up just a bit. My topic was to lecture on the family. The event was rapidly approaching. I didn't have a clue what I was going to say, to be honest. As I was struggling with this, my own two sons, Paul, about four at the time, and Patrick, about one and a half, got into a verbal battle. I clicked on a cassette tape deck and recorded every word of it. The event was held right here in the theater. I told the audience I had the perfect family and to just sit back and listen so they could model the ideal behavior of my sons and myself. The tape revealed a totally different story, of course, with my kids having a verbal battle royale while I occasionally screamed at them. A typical but realistic portrait of the American family. Dr. McPhail was sitting next to me on this stage, but because of the lighting, I couldn't see his reaction or that of the audience. When I got home, Patty said, tell me you didn't play the tape. On October 20th, 1997, Dr. McPhail sent me this email at home. Howard, your presentation on Saturday was excellent. Four exclamation points. I would have been happy with three. You have established strong visibility and national recognition as a teacher and scholar in human services. Such recognition brings honor to flow, Irv. Irv? We're on a first name basis now. This was getting pretty good. In 1998, Dr. McPhail left flow for another job. A chapter in the history of flow Valley seemed to close as rapidly as it opened. I never talked or corresponded with him again. On Thursday, October 5th, 2020, Dr. McPhail died of COVID. On January 22nd, 1998, after a year of working nonstop on our promotion files, Joanne Galanis and I were promoted to full professors. We couldn't have been happier. In an unprecedented move, the promotion committee asked me if I would want run a workshop for them on the use of humor in the creation of the promotion file. How could I say no? The last line of my promotion file evaluation marks significant weaknesses read, he has not been cloned. And oh yes, I don't want to forget this. Dr. K. Ann Dempsey provided me with a reference letter without me ever asking her for one. I became a full professor in four years, which I had been told was nearly impossible. For me, this was a wild, busy, and crazy era at our college, but a wonderful time I shall never forget. So, what did I learn from the secret history of the college that may be able to help you? First, try to become 
the teacher or professor who had a profound impact on your life, transform yourself into the teacher you always wanted. Second, use humor and creativity in your teaching because education is such serious business. Third, and maybe, just maybe, Jung's concept of synchronicity holds some validity. The people and events in your life, even this very day, that seem like chance factors may be there for a reason to help you with the next logical step in your life and your career. Four, don't be afraid to ask colleagues for assistance. And finally, five, take your colleagues with you on your career journey when it is beneficial for both parties. As for me, this will be my final lecture as a full-time professor prior to my retirement, so somebody else can continue the exciting ongoing history of human services at the Flow Valley campus. So my only question to you is this. What will you say when you win the Underwood? Thank you and long live the Flow Valley Mystique. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.